All right, we are recording. Hi there, everyone. I am Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. I'm an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester. I'm the founder and CEO of Brightline Eating Solutions, the author of the yay New York Times bestselling book just came out and hit the New York Times bestseller list of Brightline Eating, the science of living happy, thin and free. And I am super excited to be here today with Gary Taubes, who is an award-winning investigative journalist and the co-founder of the Nutrition Science Initiative and a best-selling author himself, author of one of my favorite books, The Case Against Sugar, which I have right here. Uh, it sits on my kitchen island. Um, and Gary and I are just going to be chatting for a little bit, and we're so excited that you have joined us. Gary, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you accepting this invitation to have a chat. Well, thank you for asking. And... Um... Yeah, so Susan, you and I, we spoke, we briefed each other yesterday, mm -hmm. so we came to the conclusion that the, we came to our nutrition research from entirely different points, entirely different perspectives, and we both focused, ended up obsessed with the effect of sugar and white flour. Yeah. So tell me yeah. yours again. Yeah, I mean, so my, I come from an addiction background, so I'm an addict, um, and uh, you know, I, I pass for normal today, but I, I know that I'm walking around with a head uh, on these shoulders that's ridiculously, outrageously susceptible to addiction, and uh, my life has proved as much. Um, and so I, I come at it myself from having felt in my own brain and my own body that sugar is more addictive than crack. So I, I bottomed out on crystal meth and crack cocaine in my teenage years and I've been hopelessly addicted to both. And uh, after I put down crack and got clean and sober when I was 20, uh, I became more hope, more hooked on sugar than I'd ever been hooked on anything in my life and uh, became obese and was trying to lose weight. And meanwhile, like successful in every area of my life after I got clean, you know, academic accolades and all kinds of great stuff, but I couldn't stop eating, you know, raw cookie dough, pints of ice cream, you know, and then the flour too, the pizza, the, all that stuff, the pasta, the bread. Um, so let me ask, let me ask you quick because the first chapter of my book, Drug or Food, I talk about the research. I say the research is actually ambiguous on sugar and, and addiction because we know it's very addictive to rats and mice, and I, you talk about Serge Ahmed's research in France, and so do I. Yep. You actually are one of the rare people, or one of the people who can speak. From personal experience about whether and which is more addictive. I make the, the comment that you can't even do these studies, particularly in children, because they're slightly yeah. unethical to give kids, you know, cocaine or sugar and see which is worth. <laughs> you have personal experience, but you also, one of the things, you know, with seven, uh, 12 step programs, it's, it's actually recommended in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that they should use sugar as a transition. Drug, yeah. a kind of healthy addiction. That it helps the cravings. Yeah. If you're jonesing yeah. for alcohol, have a little sugar, it'll help the cravings. Yeah. And you, you wouldn't even go there, right? For alcohol. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, so it will help the cravings. I mean, sugar and alcohol are almost molecularly identical, right? Except for that whole ethanol compound that's going to make you intoxicated, right? But um, uh, so. And the nucleus accumbens wants its dopamine hit, right? So right. It, it'll get it from sex or gambling or shopping or alcohol, sugar, cocaine, whatever. They're, they're relatively interchangeable when you look at the nucleus accumbens. Um, and so how do I feel about it? I mean, I have used substitute addictions and sometimes I have felt like, you know, I've got 22 and a half, but who's counting? I sound like an eight year old, right? 22 and a half years clean and sober. And um, I have sometimes felt like, that stretch of perfect longevity for me from the moment I walked into my first 12 step meeting is largely due to the fact that I've had other things to use. Like I have, I have struggled on and off with, with sugar and with, with flour during that time. Um, so when I, when I'm Jones and Jones for a fix, I don't need to go back to the crack pipe, you know, cause okay. I can, I can go get a cookie, you know? So, um, so how do I feel about it? I feel like, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about it. You know, some, sometimes you got to do what works, you know, if sugar oh fix but um, you know, I have lower levels addiction you know I've got coffee caffeine and I've got nicotine and I could not have gotten off nicotine I mean 50, 20 years after quitting cigarettes I still chew about one nicotine a day which oh, I Jones for. Okay. so I, I get it I get it but we both push 
when we, we talk about sugar, and you're very, so your bright line is, that's, a, that's a, a more than a line in the sand. That's like a, a wall uh, between us and Mexico as far as. <laughs> yeah, for me, for me, the bright line needs to be bright. For me, if it's not bright, my, my whole world starts to spiral out of control really quickly. Like if I have any sugar, um, I, um, I can't even tell you how sort of um, desperate and um, like uh, profoundly unstable and not okay. I start to feel really quickly. Like I, I start to need, need rehab really quickly. Um, now I have a lot of support so I can kind of get myself back on track. But um, I go, I go years and years and years without a single taste of sugar. And so how do you avoid it in, cause it's in every virtually every processed food. So you, I eat real food. I don't eat, I don't eat that shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Uh, I'll say that again in case. You're the one with an academic uh, appointment. I can say it because, you know, a journalist, we're allowed. Um, I mean, really, I eat, you know, I eat, I eat broccoli and salad and, you know, yogurt and oatmeal and fruit and, you know, nuts and seeds. And, you know, I eat real food. I don't eat, I don't eat stuff that comes out of packages, you know. So what kind of fruit? Because again, and this is a, question I always get because I'm as hardcore ultimately about sugar as you are and I inform my discussion of it from my own addiction. I know that I would never try to smoke cigarettes in moderation and I know that drinking coffee in moderation has failed me my whole life. Um, although maybe not because it keeps me going. The um, fruit, what about fruit? I, I mean the, yeah. it's a much smaller dose clearly. It's longer to digest clearly but it's still sugar there's still fructose and super- yeah i you know what i experienced for myself um i have about as an as addictable a brain as it's possible to have uh i i think i i'm i've, I've earned that one i can say that for me the the fructose in fruit um wrapped in the fiber lattice network every piece of fruit has plenty of soluble and insoluble fiber they make you know makes this this fiber lattice network that blunts the flood of the fructose into the digestive system and i always eat fruit with a meal i know that lots of people talk about because i think there was this you know um fit for life program back in the 70s or whatever that said you got to eat you know nothing but fruit in the morning and with nothing else and then don't eat anything after that and they sort of popularized this idea that fruit needs to be eaten on an empty stomach or separate from other foods i say the opposite i say if you're going to eat fruit eat it with a meal so you've got fat and car and and protein to ground out that glycemic load and for me with a meal one piece of fruit at breakfast and one piece of fruit at lunch is totally fine. And I've got, you know, 20,000 people losing 300,000 pounds over the last couple of years and a bigger pr- proportion of people getting to goal weight. As a matter of fact, 280 times more likely to get to goal weight and stay there on my program than any other commercial weight loss program in the world. Um, and, and we're walking testimony to the idea that fruit with a meal twice a day, weight and measured, um, is actually fine. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't keep mm. insulin from coming down. Like you're fine. Okay. Do you, I'm just curious now, do you crave it? When you think of the meal coming, do you think, yeah, I'm getting that apple slices in my, uh, <laughs> no, you know, my pot I, do, I do love my honey crisp apples. And sometimes, uh, no, I don't though. No, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm free. I'm, and I know the difference. Um, I can start to crave what cheese, cheese is pretty addictive. It's, it's on my food plan, but cheese, I can start to crave, but the fruit, I don't, really crave the fruit no i know there's some people who have some people um their their um insulin sensitivity it just doesn't come back very quickly um you know they're insulin resistant and um i think there's genetic individual differences in how readily the system recalibrates to being sensitive to insulin and so for some people um pineapple is just just never really a good idea you know um but uh you know i think i think an apple or some blueberries for just about everybody is okay at meals, you know, not too much, like a serving, six ounces or a piece, you know, like an apple or whatever. Well, again, this is where we come to this from different perspectives. So I'm more of a, uh, uh, you know, get insulin as low as possible. And the way to get insulin as low as possible is to replace all the non uh, uh, veg- green vegetable carbs with fat. Mm-hmm. So I, and again, I'm not allowed as a journalist to give dietary advice, although it's a thin line that I've always crossed because there are obvious implications from my books. But, um, yeah, you know, you are primarily so and it's something we, we haven't discussed sugar, white flour, 
bright line, don't cross. I don't say white flour, Gary. I say flour. Just flour. Well, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Even better. Once you grind it up, I don't care what it's made out of. You've turned it into a drug. Like all those white powders. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what if? What about pumpernickel? What about the uh, you know the, the unrefined? Uh, uh, I'm not unrefined. Of it. You just you've you've exponentially increased the surface area of each of those particles like that. So that I don't know if you know Dr. Alan Christensen. He's a he's a good friend and he writes books and stuff. He's a great guy and he says that the analogy he likes is you think of digestion as melting ice. You right. throw a block of ice on the blacktop. It's going to take yeah. hours to melt. You put snow cone shavings on the blacktop. It melts on contact. And so once you've taken any kind of plant and you've ground it down. And now the digestive enzymes go, they have a field day with it. So it's flour. It doesn't really matter. Once it's ground up, it's okay, no. So green juice is gone. No, no okay. Green juice. Yeah, I know. I know. I take a stand against green juice. It's crazy. But yeah. Potatoes. Easily digestible, unrefined. Pota white potatoes are molecularly equivalent to white flour. I know. Uh, yeah, potatoes are, are a weird one. And um, on, on their, their uh, you know, so French fries and potato chips, I think, are, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty much drugs. Um, and so, um, yeah, white potatoes. No, but even boiled potatoes. See, the French fries and potato chips have significant fat added to the yeah. carbs. What about, yeah, exactly. I'm just, and I'm curious, I'm just kind of probing your thinking. Yeah. I'm not sure about these things myself. Again, I've spent decades now researching this stuff. And yeah. um, I, I would think potatoes would be a mistake, but they are unrefined. And then you get to sweet potatoes. We get in the whole paleo world. Yeah, again. Right, right. But let's yeah. stick with white potatoes at the moment. Or so here's, he, here's where I want to tell you about your, you say you're probing my thinking. My thinking comes from 20 years in 12-step food programs. I'm not in a 12-step food program now because I do bright line eating now, but for 20 years I was. And I watched, you know, and I, I started fellowships in Australia and stuff. Like I was pretty, like people would come to me, like call Susan, she'll know, you know. And I watched over the years, thousands of people who have brains like mine succeed or not succeed tweaking various things. And so here's what I can say, Gary, for example, is I can say pretty much definitively from my clinical experience in those programs, that brown flour will do you in that right. thinking it's just white flour you will stay heavy right and so my thinking comes from experience with what works and um sort of a lab like i can tell you you don't need to go atkins to lose all your weight and keep it off if you're obese you don't need to like i get the theory that you want to take all those carbs out of the you know by the way i hate the word carbs but you want to take all those you know all carbohydrates why, why do i hate the word carbs Oh, Carbs or carbohydrates? Because I, I carbohydrates are fine. That refers to a class yeah. of macronutrient. That's an accurate right. term. Carbs I hate because people use it. It's an unhelpful word. Like people say, "Oh yeah, you got your program has no carbs, right?" And I'm like, "Uh, wait a second. We eat apples. We eat spinach. You know." Right, right, so right. when people say carbs, you know, there's this gradation from like, you know, white potatoes, white rice, sugar on one hand. You know, then you've got apples in the middle, and maybe sweet potatoes in there, and then you've got you know, spinach and kale on the other side, which everyone thinks you should eat pretty much. And carbs refers to the whole spectrum, but people really use it to refer to this other side here. Right. And, they, and it leaves things Carbohydrate like- Carbohydrate-rich yeah. foods with yeah. the absent fiber. Eat. Right, so I like sugar and flour, because other than the white potato issue, it pretty much covers what you should be abstaining from. No, sugar. we still have white rice. We've got the rice, we've got the- yeah, white rice and, and white potatoes, I think. Uh, rice, period, brown or rice. I assume if since you don't draw the line on white and brown flour, you probably wouldn't draw the line on white and brown. They're, they're actually in my plan. Rice is a whole, it's not ground up. It's fine. Right. But, it's but on the weight loss food plan, you don't have any. So here's, so back to the potato thing. What I've found works is you take, you strip out grains. That's the category, grains. Um, and potatoes are in that category, even though, you know, biologically. Grains, yeah. um, but we put them in there. Um, you strip out grains during the weight loss phase, except for a tiny serving of grain at breakfast, which is usually like oatmeal, right? Uh, and it's way to measure. It's pretty small. Um, you str other than that, you strip out grains from lunch and dinner entirely. And you have people eating protein, fat, vegetables, a serving of fruit at lunch. And um, 
And then however long it takes them to lose their weight, it could be two months, it could be a year in two months. And then when they transition to maintenance, they add back in some grain um, and they can bump, you know, add more food to transition. And it seems to work. By that point, the body is healed enough that rice is fine. Potatoes are fine. In weighed and measured quantities with a meal with protein and fat to couch it, it's fine. Yeah. Interesting. Now, there's a lot of folks, um, again, it's an issue I discussed in my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. The medical community tends to frown, <laughs> and rightfully, on anecdotal evidence. And so if you admit that your thinking was shaped by your own experience, that somehow makes you biased. Right. Of course, it also implies that people have no experience and wouldn't even self-experiment or somehow experts. So the absence of curiosity is then considered a stamp of expertise. And I've never quite understood that as well. Yeah. But a criticism of your work would be, you know, come on, it worked for her, but that doesn't mean it works for everyone. And then you say, well, I've got 20,000 people, I've lost 300,000 pounds. But the argument would be that's not a randomized controlled trial. They might have lost 300,000 pounds or 400,000 pounds on a different approach. Well, and then the argument to that is, but they don't, right? So we have data on rates of weight loss and Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig and whatever. And like I said, people doing my program are 280 times more likely to get down to goal weight. So what, well, what, we, what we've got for it. So that wasn't a randomized control trial. We will do them. You know, we're bright line eating is like two years old and we're just bootstrapping our way up. But what we have for the first time in human history in bright line eating is, um, is a model of actually taking a cohort of people, getting them over, overweight or obese, getting them down to goal weight, and then helping them to stay there for some period of time. It's never been done before in the scientific literature. It's never been done. There's not a single published paper. And so we've done it. And that's the first model of effective weight loss that's ever existed. I mean, Weight Watchers gets people to lose 10, 15 pounds on average, you know, in six months, and then they start gaining back. So, um, yeah, so th th I'm sure there'll be plenty of detractors, plenty, but I'm going to be feisty about it because I think we're showing something pretty exciting. I can tell feisty is something you do effortlessly. Um, the, yeah, it's an interesting issue. I'm not sure, you know, there are a lot of people out there who, uh, I mean, you're right. Clear, well, again, the, the argument I've been making over the years is that because our understanding of obesity and how to get a, achieve weight loss has been so flawed, and all, and all these programs, for the most part, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, rely on some variation of getting people to eat less and exercise more. This is based on what I think is a flawed paradigm, for better or for worse. And if people had done it right, to so even you know, the low-carb, high-fat diets, of which you know uh, Atkins was just a, one of many in a long stream going back to Banting in 1865. The people would go on these diets, they would enjoy them, they would find them the weight loss apparently effortless, this is anecdotal, and then their doctors would talk them out of it on the basis that they were killing them. And as you know, if your doctor is trying to convince you, you should eat sugar and flour in moderation because it's good for you, or the dietary fat is bad for you, you're probably going to jump at that. Um, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten over the years from people who said, oh, yeah, I lost 60 pounds on a low-carb, high-fat diet, or I did, you know, protein power, sugar busters, or South Beach and lost 80 pounds, and then it stopped working for me. And I said, well, did it, it just stop working? And they said, well, I went back to eating the way I used to, and I gained the weight back. And so my argument has been, you know, these carbohydrates, the same carbs you target as uniquely addictive, I target as uniquely fattening. Mm -hmm. And the end result is any diet will work that removes them. And then the question is both what's sustainable and what's most effective at removing them. You know, there's, you have a tremendous uh, track record in your bright line eating. There are other people who would claim if not to 20,000 people, but ketogenic diets and paleo diets, again, removing sugar, flour, grains, easily digestible carbs, at least in the weight loss phase. You know, again, the same approach with different uh, packaging or different, Yeah. Uh, hard to tell which is better or worse, but we all agree that sugar, flour, Grains have to go if you are want to lose the weight. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you do you have people? Do you understand when people 
fail on your approach, why they fail? Because that's clearly there are people, I would say clearly there are people for whom they've been obese too long. There are other hormones that are involved in fueling fat accumulation. So women in particular, as they get older and go through menopause, are going to have more trouble losing weight, um, regardless of what they do. We have data on that, actually. So um, across a couple thousand women, um, we have looked at our boot camp data. So this is eight-week data. Um, on average, people lose 17 pounds in an eight-week boot camp with us. And um, the, the highest peaks of weight loss are in the decades of the 20s and the 50s for women. 20s and 50s. Um, with 18.5 pounds on average lost in the boot camp. And in their 60s and 70s, those numbers only go down to 17 pounds and then uh, 15.8 pounds. In their, in their 70s, women are losing 15.8 pounds in eight weeks in my Brightline Eating Boot Camp. Almost not significantly different from women in their 20s and 30s. That's so, interesting. Yeah, we're not seeing a huge age effect, but your question is really well taken. So here's another statistic from our boot camps, which is that 84% of people coming out of the boot camp report little to no food cravings anymore ever. Um, and that's over 50% at the end of the first week. You just get sugar and flour out of their system for a week and they're re reporting to little to no cravings ever. See, that's where I think it's different than nicotine, at least, and probably crack cocaine. Um, and now going back to personal experience, with me, out of sight is out of mind with sugar. With cigarettes, it didn't matter how out of sight it was. When I was trying to quit, it took me weeks and weeks and weeks to stop actively craving. Like my neurons were yeah. you know, anxiously waiting their next hit. So you, but they, on some level, they have to be different types of addictions, or at least different qualitative Something different is going on. Maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't know if people are wired for, for a primary addiction. I mean, I think there are plenty of people for whom the sugar kind of keeps calling. So, I mean, I said 84%. There are 16% there that are not experiencing yeah. it, right? And, and uh, you know, 3 to 5% report high cravings at the beginning of the boot camp, like 4 or 5 out of 5 really high cravings. And they're still there at the end of the boot camp, like no decrease at all. And we haven't looked at their brains or their blood or anything to see what might be going on there. But um, I, I think there's a lot of individual differences. And, you know, the findings that they found with that Biggest Loser study that, that came out last year and stuff, looking at um, metabolic decrease and then another study from Australia looking at hormone changes as you lose weight. Right, but those, again, those are using calorie restriction to lose the weight. Totally, so, right? Starvation to lose the weight. And totally. you don't know if the effects are seeing are due to the semi-starvation or due yeah. to the weight loss. Exactly. And I can't wait to, to do the comparable study in Brightline Eating because we're not, by and large, seeing those effects. You know, the people that we've got who are maintaining, you know, one and 200 pound weight losses now at a BMI of 20, I mean, slender, right. you know, they're not, you know, looking to gnaw off a leg. They're, they're fine. You know, um, their bodies are not fighting them to gain back that weight. So, Yeah. But some people are struggling in the program for sure. We do not have a 100% success rate, of course. And so I wonder if there is something in the blood or in the brain of somebody who starts off that, that predisposes them to not be successful, if their bodies are fighting them somehow. Um, I don't know, you know. An interesting question. Um, again, it'll be interesting to see what happens as your patient says you're – your clients keep going and whether those cravings go away in those that percent. And the other interesting aspect, and because I get this question a lot, how do I deal with sugar cravings? And again, because I'm one of these people who thinks butter and bacon are health foods. Um, you know, it seems there's animal research going back to the 30s that if you did jack up the fat content of the diet, it'll reduce the craving for carbohydrates in general. And so it'd be interesting to see if these people, if they consumed more fat, um, whether that would help blunt their sugar cravings. To me, it certainly may, you know, you're eating like Julia Child's French cooking minus the pastry and the, the potatoes right. so, um, and the bread. Yeah, right. So it's... Right. Uh, so Gary, you wrote an article that I love that I refer mm -hmm. people to all the time that came out in the New York Times and it's an article exonerating salt. And, right. um, I just, first of all, I just want to thank you for that article. I don't know if you 
of course you don't know that I've been out here like reading that <laughs> and sending it out and loving it. But um, you know, there was a snow job done on salt. Like salt is salt is not only fine, it's really necessary. And it's way, way, way worse to cut salt out of your diet entirely than it is to eat too much salt. And people don't actually eat too much salt if you leave them. Well, that's, salt, you know, once you get rid of the sugar and if you're targeting the sugar and the flour, what do you have left to make the food taste good? And your target, again, the argument in my books and the research that led me into this entire field was the salt blood pressure question. And the point is obesity, diabetes, heart disease, they're all hypertensive conditions. Right. So the question is whatever's causing the hypertension in those conditions is likely causing the hypertension even before those conditions show up. Yeah. You know, blood, high blood pressure is a, a part of metabolic syndrome. So you're looking at what's raising insulin, what's causing insulin resistance, and that's going to be a sugar and flour issue. It's not going to be a salt issue. Yeah. So again, one of the arguments I've been making for years is that as an investigative journalist is that our nutrition researchers didn't know how to do science, quite frankly. So they, they got an idea, an interesting hypothesis. They fell in love with their hypothesis. No matter how many studies failed to confirm their hypothesis, they just insisted they must be right. And salt was one of them. And dietary fat was one of them. And the idea that we get fat just because we eat too many calories was the mother of all of them. Mm -hmm. And we're slowly shedding all of these, but it's a very slow process. And once institutions embrace them, when you yeah. start getting advice from the American Heart Association, the NIH, and the, yeah. you know, to eat less salt, it's hard for them to back paddle. We can yes. say we made a mistake. It's not great for our credibility, but we can say it. The yeah. institutions can't say it. Yeah. And I, I, I guide people to clean up their diet, and then they come to me and they say, I'm dizzy. And I say, Because your blood pressure is too low. Are you salting your food? Because they, you know, they, they had some doctor a long time ago when they had high blood pressure tell them yeah. to cut out salt, which was the only thing they could effectively do because salt is not addictive. And this is another point that I make in my book is that you've got people running around saying that the addictive foods are sugar, fat, and salt. And I'm like, there's no evidence for that. The addictive foods are sugar and flour and salt makes food more palatable. Yeah, you'll eat a little more of it. You'll eat 11% more broccoli if you put some butter and salt on it. Um, but that's, that doesn't, you know, nobody's driving out into the night to go get some buttered salt <laughs> broccoli. They're, they're, going for, you know, they're going for a chocolate bar. They're going for ice cream. They're going for pizza, you know, and uh, it's the sugar and flour. So. One of my favorite lines in my sugar book was back in the 1920s when uh, American researchers were, were uh, British researchers were discussing the possibility that sugar was as addictive as alcohol. And in America, this was like 1924, and an American uh, researcher was quoted in the newspaper saying, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but we don't have any stories about somebody who ate two ice cream cones and went home and beat up his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely better in some ways. Yeah. Um, you know, the... Um, but okay, I just I just want to say that's hilarious. But like the but you point out in your book, I was just, you know, uh, mm -hmm. taking a look and, you know, you point out that, you know, between 70 and 80,000 people this year are going to walk into a leg amputation because of their type two diabetes. Right. And still know it's coming. Like they know they have diabetes and they know that they're starting to lose feeling and, you know, their eyesight's going and their doctors have told them to change the way they eat. And they they opt they opt out of that limb instead of opting out of, you know, their sugar and their flour. So, well, but their doctors aren't even telling them to opt out of sugar and flour. Their doctors are telling them to opt out of fat and to eat less and exercise more. So they're getting the wrong advice. Again, finally, this is shifting. Yeah. But, you know, we have, uh, and the medical community thinks that what your clients, your patients did is not possible. Right. So their belief system is diets don't work. And we know diets don't work because we do these terrible free living diet studies. And at the end of the year, people have only lost six pounds. And therefore, we can just work on our drug development. And we can get funding from the pharmaceutical industry and the drug industry can make a lot of money. And we can keep telling people it doesn't really matter what you eat. Just let's treat it with let us treat it with drugs. Everyone's happier. So a whole yeah. mindset yeah. that targets drug therapy instead of prevention, instead of successful dietary therapy. Yeah. yeah. And just, I guess, in closing, it's just a great way to sort of end. Um, do you think, Gary, that we're on the precipice of a real change? Like, do you think people are starting to get how bad sugar is? Uh, yes, clearly. Well, 
But if you look at sugar consumption, it's been coming down since 1999. So soft drink consumption has been coming down. That's when it peaked. As soon as we recognized there was an obesity epidemic, some people started looking around to say what was causing it. A lot of people just assumed it was gluttony and sloth, but it's been coming steadily down. And I think that your work and my work and others have, you know, shifted how people think about this food. So less about moderation and more about thinking about how to avoid it. Yeah. Um, so I think we're, I think with sugar, we're winning. Some of these other beliefs I think are going to be with us regrettably for a little yeah. too long. Yeah. I feel the shift too. It feels like, you know, I remember, and I know you remember, you know, when there was smoking on airplanes and, you know, smoking in restaurants and, you know, um, I, there's been a big shift, you know, you like, you can smoke, but you got to go off on your own, you know, in your own private place to go have a cigarette today. And I think in it, what I'd love to see is a society where, you know, people didn't bring in donuts to work. Like they would realize like, this isn't doing anyone any favors. You know, like if you want to go to eat a donut, go drive yourself to Dunkin' Donuts and get one. But the, that's poison. People are dying and yeah. it's yourself, you know? You know, um, my friends here in Oakland, they all, everybody knows what I do now. It's all clear. I've written a book called the case against sugar. And I've still had people say, look, when you, you know, you bring my kids to school, could you bring in this box of donuts for their teachers? Cause you're taking the kids to school today instead of, you know, the neighbors down the street. And it's like, you know, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> um, I'm still waiting for the day that the last day that we see a juice box, we didn't talk about juice, but I suspect you think um, of juice as juice another. Is, ju juice is Coke. It's Pepsi. I mean, there's, there's yeah. so yeah. it's soft drinks without the carbonation and with vitamins. Yeah. Um, anyway, so this is, we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. Um, we probably live in kind of highly informed areas of the world. There are others where this message is going to take longer to get there, but it's, yeah. it's out. It's out now. Yeah. So. Well, okay. thank you, B. Thank you for being a, uh, a colleague on the in the on the fight in the on the journey <laughs> in the well, battle <laughs> it's it, it's uh gives us something to do with our life <laughs> yes it does it windmills. it's a good uh it's a good mission it's a good mission yeah and now is that smoke coming up from, yeah i had a candle uh, and i must have jostled the table I've, i have some candles okay just uh, checking that it wasn't a cigarette. <laughs> a cigarette no no i quit like you a long time ago and like you it was freaking hard yeah um, not as hard as sugar for me, but uh, it was hard. I've quit smoking many times. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Gary. Fun. Nice to talk with you. Okay. Bye.